Now, will we find hidden strengths or structural flaws in this cheap Chinese carbon frame? Maybe even some horsehair. Okay. Have you seen horsehair? I'm not sure if this video is a costly disaster or a serious scientific endeavor. Now, I've teamed up with Rob from Carbon Bike Repair UK, who I got in contact with a few months ago. Rob is going to use his fancy £40,000 Ghana to give my cheap £300 Chinese carbon frame a high resolution 3D scan. Is alien technology. But it's not just about the scan, we're also going to cut this Chinese carbon frame in half, inspect the carbon layup under a microscope, and that's just the tip of the iceberg, my friends. That is why I'm going to be breaking it down into a two-part series to make sure I can cram absolutely everything in. I arrived at Carbon Bike Repair UK expecting to bash some frames with some stone hammers like something out of the Flintstones. You are naive. Rob has a custom built rig that holds frames in place while he waves his fancy wand around, aka his expensive scanner, to create this high resolution 3D scan of any frame. In this case, my cheap Chinese carbon frame. To quote Rob, it takes technology to build these frames, so it makes sense to use technology to fix them, right? What this scanner does is basically create the reverse of a mold. So what is a mold? Now, I'm glad you asked. It's half the magic that goes into making a bike frame. Now, you see, you need two halves of a mold to create a complete mold. You put the carbon inside each half, close it up, apply heat, lots of heat and lots of compression to activate the carbon and resin. And hey presto, you've got a bike frame. Okay, I'm sure there's a little bit more to that and people are banging their screens, but that's the basics. Now back to our scan. From the 3D render, we can isolate the frame from the jig, which was done automatically by the software at a click of a button. And even though this resolution may seem low, you can still see the software picking out little imperfections. We would look for anomalies on the surface. It's like a little thing there, this mark here. So what we do is we do a tertiary scan and we're looking for things like delamination areas, wear on these parts. It's not just the surface that can be checked, the frame geometry can also be checked as well as like the roundness of holes for example. The surface here. So that is a straight line, it tells me that that is geometrically 100% straight. Same with holes, we can inspect the roundness of holes. So it's created a ge geometric circle because yeah. it's recognised this as a full circle. From the software, the top tube looks straight, definitely don't want that one to be wonky, and the bottom bracket roundness wasn't looking bad at all. And I just want to take a second to take in how crazy this system actually is. Rob also has this thermographic heat camera that can check how heat is dissipated from frames and forks. What? Now let's take it to the next level and look at the stress testing analysis. That's right, there's more. What we call a stress test analysis. Okay. on the repaired frame compared to original one, uh, which is phenomenal. So let's say we did a repair on this area here. We would be able to do a like-for-like -like test yeah. of the good side yeah. with a deformation of say five kilos or whatever it is. Yeah. And we'd be able to measure on that scanner and then do it on the repaired side. Yeah. And if there's a tolerance difference either way, uh, it means we've ever made that repair too strong okay. or the repair is not strong enough. So this is a really cool way that technology works works for us now in carbon repair, which before it wasn't possible. It's, so digital scanning, awesome. yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. To show you just how detailed this scan is, we can increase the resolution of the scan by four times. Four times button, right, it's telling me it's, it's good to go. Let's analyze the area now, which is mean it's purple or green. Yeah. You can see the way the triangles have changed. Uh, this image gives us an example of what happens when you increase the polygon mesh on a model. Now the first image is far less detailed than the last image. This is what the software is doing to give us a super in-depth look. It's adding more polygons to the mesh. And then you can see little anomalies like this. In the repair process, the automation process yeah. works on the same resolution. It will, if it sees a lump there, and you tell it to smooth over the top of it, it will. For years we've been doing that by hand, by eye, yeah. with jigs, hand jigs, tools, all the stuff we would do when we started. We now have yeah. the facilities or the, the investment to be able to do that. So now we are able to, 
to, to do that. For me, all of this info really is an eye opener as someone who buys carbon frames and cheap Chinese carbon frames. So we have covered the high end technology scan. Let's look at the manual check, which is equally as interesting to me. It's like high end technology versus a highly trained human eye. So over to the traditional bike stand we go, nothing like getting a frame in the jaws. Let's see what Rob has to say about this cheap Chinese carbon frame. The arch on the seat tube is yes. quite old school. Everything's a little fat on this. Yeah, it's a little less good. sophisticated. Just like its rider then. This used to, used to be a rim brake which they've, they've filled in. Okay. okay, and then they've added this on with similar types of uh, uh, milling CNC machining yeah, yeah, yeah. to machine out a disc brake system. To give some context, the molds that we mentioned earlier are super expensive to manufacture. This frame has been made from a modified rim brake mold, as you can see by the raised brake mounts, which are there for a rim brake bike, which are filled in, we hope. This is to save cost. It's easier to modify an existing mold instead of creating a brand new one. Rob also suggested that they have thrown a lot of carbon at this frame. They've thrown carbon at this bike, okay, to make it safe and structurally strong. I mean, it's quite heavy. If you have poor construction techniques, but loads of carbon, then it's basically a way to try and ensure that you have the strength in the frame, but as a side effect, you increase the weight. Now on that point, Rob grabbed a Canyon frame as a comparison, and we made a few points. Yeah. I I'm not endorsed by Canyon. Yeah. Uh, we fix a lot of Canyons. As you can see, one of the biggest areas on the Canyon is the drive side seat stays. For any bike, yeah. these are vulnerable areas. They're gonna start to suffer these things, a little bit like an eggshell, very, very, very thin, I got ya. but very, uh, high performance bike is this if we look at the difference in the stains oh, yes. it's, okay it's, okay it's, it's a different bike yeah. so you know we're comparing apples and pears but you can see the kind of work that's gone into the yeah. the stays I mean this is this is almost I would oh, say yeah. probably double in size for the same weighted rider so you ask yourself why maybe the designer of the bike doesn't actually know that much about design and is using some pre-made mold yeah and he's just made, knocking bikes out he doesn't really care whereas these guys have thought through what they want this is a climbing bike right so they yeah. need it to be ultra light this is kind of this is not a climbing bike yeah this is more of a sprinter's bike but yeah it's not at the most aerodynamic one thing that i did miss in my initial overview is a sloppy fit of that bottom plate covering the rooted cables underneath the bottom bracket if this was a, a high-end bike trek specialized Panorello, yeah. you probably wouldn't get something like this. And that is lined up with the hole. So if you say, I don't care, yeah. I bought the bike for 200 quid new, what does, it, does it really matter, Rob? And I say, it doesn't matter. Mm. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter! When I was talking about carbon fiber being cheap, much cheaper these days, this is something that we didn't see for many, many years until very recently. With these parts on such a cheap bike would normally always be a plastic. This is a piece of carbon fiber. So they've made on such a cheap end bike tells you how much of the stuff is lying around yeah. and how, how easy it is to mold this kind of stuff compared okay. to plastic. So while we all tend to focus our attention directly on the frame, off camera Rob explained just how important the structure of the fork is for reasons we will speak about later in the video. And straight away, just by feel, Rob spotted something. If you watch this, right, watch my fingers. Flex. Yeah, that's quite a lot of flex. This is a known brand. Yeah. Same pressure. Yeah. I'm really struggling, okay? And I'm not I'm not hamming it up. Yeah. I don't need to. A known brand like Planet X, everyone knows this is budget end. Yeah. It's a little stiffer. Yeah. Let's check this one again. Oh yeah. Yeah, you can see it in the, yeah. This one is wobbly. Okay. Wobbly, that's not the word we want, is it Rob? <laughs> <laughs> Not on forks, my friend. So the stiffer one, the stiffer one is actually similar wall thickness. We're looking around here. Yeah. The thickness here. So my question is then why, if it's carbon fiber, why is this one flexing so much more? And it could be two things. It could be as simple as the radius on the base here is yeah. too tight. Yeah. I think it's quite tight if we take this side, okay? It's okay. quite a tight radius compared to that one. Look at that one. It's much rounder. Uh -huh, see, and what yeah. that does is it causes a lot of tension in this area, flex tension, tight, whereas tight. this one is a more represented on this corner. So yeah. I always say in designs, I always look for 
curve, bit, bigger, ra- uh, you know, yeah. more gentle radiuses than very tight radiuses like this, because this tends to cause this cantilever effect of a long solid blade. Yes, cantilevered on a very tight corner. Oh, it makes sense. So you know, but it depends on what the design is and what thickness wheels you're going to be putting inside this fork. It's, there's all sorts of reasons. For me, this was super interesting information. It shows just how important the design process is, and how something as simple as a smoother radius can impact the strength or flex of certain parts of the frame. This brings us nicely onto the most vulnerable part of the frame. The crown race is, without argument, the most dangerous part of the bike. If you told me if one of your stays broke, right? Yeah. You tell me, if that broke there, Yeah. how many other parts of the rear of the bike have you got to, to, to stop the entire bike from collapsing? Two, three other parts. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you were to have a head tube fracture, Yeah and it fractured there yeah you still got another whole chunk if that hasn't broken yeah, yeah. to keep you going but here you are leaning over the front in time trial position and you hit a pothole and that cracks there's nowhere to go once no the safe. it's basically the rule of one yeah there's no going back in my bike build video many of you mentioned clamping the top tube and also mentioning the clamping forces for specific bolts when it's carbon clamping carbon this got me thinking about just how important it is when clamping carbon's carbon so i asked one question for you rob is the clamping force so like six newtons on the steer tube or the seat post for example is that vital yeah yeah people, people do it. you'll see this this is a no-no you can put your seat post as a good one, yeah. or you can, um, which is commonly known as your, as your oh. thing. But there are going to be a few people screaming at me on your channel for sure and saying, where the hell am I supposed to clamp it on my aero bike? Because yeah. I've made them so damn difficult to clamp on now. You, there's no way to clamp the bike. It's impossible. And that's the same with the seat. If you over tighten that, once it's gone, it's, it's gone the same on the steerer tube. If you find that your saddle is slipping down all the time and you can't, seem to get the thing to go and you clamp the hell out of it. Yeah. it might have been that you've already over clamped it and what happens is because carbon doesn't deform like metal does once you deform metal it stays deformed like a can of coke you squeeze yeah, it yeah, doesn't yeah. pop back up again okay yeah. carbon is exactly the opposite it, it unless the rest of the structure is being completely crushed then it will be deformed but if you break one side of it it, it will sit in its correct position like a seat tube with a square back and you put the clamp in yeah. and you've over clamped it it'll crack maybe while you're riding because you ride on the limit and your extra weight has caused it to crack to ride and what happens then it loses its tensile strength and the the clamp that's pushing the seat against the front of the seat tube is no longer being able to use that same pressure and it keeps on sliding down you wonder what the hell's happening interestingly i've never thought about how carbon behaves after being cracked but hearing it keeps its shape but loses its strength makes sense. Now from the scan and the inspection and generally looking around this frame for a few hours now, I'm intrigued to know what Rob thinks we'll find when we start cutting the frame up. On this one, I'm feeling, I don't know. I'm gonna say, Small. I think it's gonna be pretty much similar thickness all the way around. Um, I'd be very surprised and very impressed if I saw that the top was thinner and the sides were thicker. That's mostly the case. Another thing that, I'll, that I'd also be very impressed to see is whether they used unidirectional carbon. So what we're going to be looking at in the cutaway of the forks particularly is we're going to look for how many strand layers we can see in between there. Okay. Now I'm guessing that it's going to be okay. I think it's fairly honest and it feels quite heavy. Yep. Or, <laughs> or the frame, the bike is thick and fat like this because they want to try and compromise less compression but thicker part. Right? Okay. Yeah. So you don't have confidence in your material. Now off camera, Rob explained that higher quality frames will have a thinner carbon layup on the top of the top tube. This is to save weight and makes a frame much lighter. It's obviously a more complex technique, so not as likely to be seen in a cheap Chinese carbon frame like this one that we have. So much good info and who knew that when I started this channel I'd be scanning a cheap Chinese carbon frame with a £40,000 scanner, definitely not me. But thanks to Rob from Carbon Bike Repair, here we are. Check out their website, I'll leave a link below if you want to learn more about their services and amazing work. Now part two to this video is coming very soon, here is a sneak peek. See the watch. So make sure to subscribe so you don't miss it. I will see you very soon.